Daenerys. Night gathers, and now my watch begins, Daenerys thought, looking out at the falling snow. It shall not end until my death. The widows had told her how the rest of her days would be, a life on the sacred grasses between the Mother of Mountains and the Horse Gate. A life of reverence, they had said, though she could own no mount, take no husband, bear no children. She was forbidden from slaughtering livestock. She would rely on eunuchs for that service. During her moon blood, she would go to a separate tent with the younger women and perform ablution. The flesh of fowl was unclean to her to eat or even touch, and the altars for her hourly prayers must be clay, never stone. Above all, they had stressed, to couple was the greatest blasphemy. No man is so accursed as one who mates with a woman of the Dosh Kaleen. A lot of rapers and thieves, her brother had said of the men who stood guard on the wall. But their vow has some poetry to it. He would sometimes recite it to her at night in the common tongue or high valyrian, the latter giving the words a sinister sound. He knew it frightened her. Our grandsire's uncle even gave up the throne for a life in the cold, the fool, and a seed once rose to be Lord Commander. Daenerys did not have the patience to lead the Dosh Kaleen. The young amongst them deferred to the old, and the old amongst them to the one-eyed crone, a wrinkled corpse of a woman who said little and less. He is the stallion who mounts the world, the crone had said of her unborn son. Yet now her black eye only watched with disdain as Danny hobbled across the temple hall. The crones had given her a makeshift crutch to walk on. The gnarled piece of wood did not fit comfortably under her arm as she struggled to make her way. Danny wondered how Sir Willem ever managed to get around on such a thing. She had freedom of the city, or at least no one had told her otherwise, but to venture far from the temple, she would need to endure a thousand winces of pain. With each step, Daenerys remembered the sharp crack of her ankle when she had been dragged behind Jocko's mount. Cal Jocko and his fifty riders had found Daenerys in the Dothraki Sea, dripping with mud and blood and horse grease, standing with Drogon as he tore a chunk of charred flesh from the slowest of Jocko's horses. Daenerys had mounted Drogon's neck and met the gaze of her husband's erstwhile co as she spoke, Dracaris. Instead of breathing black fire, Drogon shook his scarlet spine. Danny clutched at his black scales, her fingers slippery with grease. As Drogon pushed off from the ground, Daenerys fell from her dragon mount. Half a hundred Dothraki cackled and howled with amusement. The dragon had not extinguished their lives, but taken flight and glided southwest towards Dragonstone. Your demon has forsaken you, Komago yelled, his voice a dagger. They tied a rope around her throat and fastened it to the halter of Jocko's stallion in the gathering dusk. Half a league later, Daenerys could run no more, and fell. Draped over the back of Mago's horse, like the carcass of a Hercar, was how she came to Jocko's Kalasar of 20,000. They found a rickety cart for her after that. Someone had managed to set her ankle and splint it. In her agony, she never knew who. The first days of her journey to Vase Dothrak were filled with jeers and laughter, Dothraki calling out Khaleesi Ragat, cart queen. Her ankle screamed with every bounce of her new throne, though Danny's own cries went unheard amongst the clatter of the marching Kalisar. Once a day, an unsung boy would feed her nearly turned mare's milk and dried horse meat, though she lacked the spit to chew it. Without any routine, a mute, dour-faced woman would change Danny's straw, perpetually soiled by her brown water. Two hundred leagues to Vastoth Rock, she overheard a rider in the cause of Mago say. A moon's turn. On the fourth day, the sky grew overcast, and on the sixth day, the rain began to fall. Only a drizzle at first, it was refreshing for the Kalisar, and a gift from the gods for Daenerys. But it rained again the following day, harder, and the day that followed, harder still. And the day that followed that, Half again is hard. Jocko's Kalisar transformed into a caravan of mud men, trudging through a great grass marsh. The rain saved Daenerys from dying of thirst, but the days grew colder and the Dothraki had donned her in no more than rags. Thirty days came and went, yet the mother of mountains was nowhere in sight. On the fortieth day of their moon's turn journey, it began to sleet. By then, Danny had no flesh or fat left on her to keep her warm. One frigid night, the skeleton that had been Daenerys Stormborn stopped shivering and fell into a dreamless slumber. She did not expect to wake, but wake she did 
to the sight of a man's stone face with the body of a dragon. The plunder of the horse lords, Daenerys knew. She took the statue as an omen, though an ill one. The Valyrian Sphinx was enveloped in a glaze of ice. Trapped, Daenerys thought, like a sentinel. In time, Danny's sense had returned with her strength. Now, under the watch of the Dosh Kaleen, her wounds were healing quickly. But for the frequent blows from the crones opening them up again, her ankle had knit enough for her to trust it with her crutch, as she tottered around learning the women's work of Vastoth Rock. The ceremonies were written in stone, and the tasks were endless, as were lectures on the magics of grass, horse, and corn. The widows were not without their humor, black as it was, as they gifted their willowy new sister the by-name Khaleesi Taloro, Queen of Bones. Small bands of raiders and fringe calisars trickled into the city day after day, and Danny watched as the crones were paid tribute in salt, silver, and seed. The gifts were often meager, and Danny caught bits of contrition from the coes and cows in defense of their offerings. Calpona was the main culprit of the other's scarcity, they all claimed. The city was filling with Dothraki, and the markets were filling with vendors, despite the snows. Every day the smell of charred horse and burning manure grew ever stronger. Those who rode with Jocko outnumbered all others in Vastothrak. But this was soon to change. Calpono was returning. Pono has killed Matho, a slave of Kaljomo whispered after presenting a sack of corn. The wives of Joma will be amongst you soon. A second rumor soon followed from the mouth of Rigoro, Kalmoro's sullen son. Pono had married the daughter of Kalzeko, with Zeko granting his Kalisar as a bride gift. By custom, the daughter passed that gift to her new husband. Daenerys understood why the Kals were returning. The bride must be presented to the Dosh Kaleen. The moon was covered by clouds as time blurred past for Daenerys. She had forgotten the day, the week, the month. The gray days grew ever shorter, the nights ever colder. She missed the sun, the stars, her dragons. Those things were of the world beyond the horse gate. She would die here, she believed, in the same city as her brother. Kalisi Taloro, Jelani said to her one night, the time has come. For what? Danny wondered, but followed the widow without a word, leaning heavily on her crutch. Danny was taken to a hidden alcove of the temple, where the shrunken crone sat on a plundered wooden bench from a faraway land. It was made from a black-barked tree, polished and lacquered. The design on its back was a tangle of foreign writing Daenerys had never seen, perhaps the words of Jogus Nye. The dark wood shimmered like metal in the lantern light. Upon the seat, the one-eyed crone looked almost a queen. "'Eat with me, child,' said the crone in the Dothraki tongue. You look more dead than me. She gestured to a stone table with a plate of horse steak, sauced in yogurt and dried pomegranate. The blood from the meat made the dish look a mess of pink and red. Daenerys sat, dipped her hands into the sauce, and ate. It was delicious. Between bites, Daenerys managed to ask, What do you want of me? They always want something. Your words. Daenerys tilted her head. What is your meaning? Why do you think Jocko did not kill you? Daenerys recalled being dragged by a stallion. He nearly did. What she said was, He is a superstitious man. The Dosh Kaleen are sacred. That made the one-eyed crone smile. So we are. That is not the reason. Jocko is strong, but he has wits as well. No man leads thousands of Dothraki without being clever. He knows the winds of Kalpono rise. Pono has cut down my motho. He has vanquished Calzeko's Kalisar and claimed his daughter as Khaleesi. Jamo and Moro are gnats who will soon be swatted. Kaljako knows his time is short. The Dothraki devour themselves. As they say in Lazar, when men have no lamb, they eat men. Daenerys bit into the steak again, chewed, swallowed. You and Jocko conspire against Kalpono. What has that to do with me? The Dosh Kaleen kneel to no one. The Dosh Kaleen bow to no one. The true power of the Dothraki lies here. You are a woman of the Dosh Kaleen. Aye, said Danny, a crippled widow with no braid and no riders. Worse than useless. Kaljako tells me that Drogo thought you magical. 
the blood of old Valyria. You are the mother of dragons, I'll agree. Men listen to your words, though they are loath to admit it. Calpona will heed you as a voice of the Dosh Kaleen, I am certain of it. And in our smokes, we see the days to come. Prophecy. Daenerys was angered. A mummer's farce, she barked. You said my son would be the stallion who mounts the world. The bells in his hair will sing his coming, the crone recited, and the milkman in the stone tents will fear his name. I remember. It was well practiced. Practiced? Daenerys blinked. Why? The crone's one eye stared long and hard at Danny. Finally, she said, The others. They call you Khaleesi Toloro not because you are thin, child. No, it's because you are of the Red Waste. The Red Waste? She did not understand. What does this old one know of my life? Daenerys began to explain. We were heading to... Karth. The crone did not let her finish. The city of the Milkmen. Daenerys knew the Carthine were called Milkmen, but she had always assumed the Dosh Kaleen spoke of Westerosi with those words. What is in Karth that concerns the Dosh Kaleen? Nothing, the shrunken widow chuckled. Your iron coward, he sold you. My brother sold me, Cal Regat. The Andal, the crone insisted. Jorah. She remembered his name all this time? He killed your brother with strong wine and a trap. Her words were a strike to the gut. True as soon as Danny heard them. Viserys, arriving drunk with no coin, drawing his sword, a voice in the common tongue egging him on. Jorah. You were to perish on the sands or on the walls of the milkmen's city. It made no matter. You, your cow, your prince. Rago, Danny whispered. She grasped her crutch and brought herself to a stand. Explain this. The crone clenched her jaw and flared her nostrils. You mourn your son, but Kalmotho was my son. When a Cal falls from his horse, a Khaleesi becomes a woman of the Dosh Kaleen. But when is a mother not so to her son? The mother of mountains will love until it is dust, as will I. She nudged a tear from her eye and chuckled again. The Dosh Kaleen know what is needed for a Cal to hear. Your Cal Drogo had the longest hair, but... You were the blade to cut it. My words came after a gift of Pantashi silver, but I would have done it with no gift, to spare my motho from the arak of your drogo. The Andal and I wanted you and your cal to go east forever, and we made it so. Pantashi silver? Illyrio, Danny stammered, he wanted us west, not east, my brother on the Iron Throne. Her words were feeble. She had asked Viserys a lifetime ago why Illyrio gave so much. Her brother had had no good answer. Deep down, Daenerys had known the Magister was playing them false. It was why she commanded Grolio to turn their ships to Slaver's Bay. Pentos was the den of the wolf. Was every gift from Illyrio poison? Daria? Viserys had been wroth after the Lyseni girl commanded him to sup with Danny. Belwas? His counsel was always urging conflict, masked with the wit of a child. Barristan? Jorah trusted him least of all. What the fat man truly wants, I am not certain, said the crone. My pippets say there was talk in the western market of an armistice. Five years of peace. Lice, Mir, Tyrosh would cease their quarrels, and the cows would seek no gifts from across the Rhoyne. Who is to know? As the sunset men say, words are wind. She reached down between her legs and picked up a small sack that Danny had failed to notice. What I know is that no one loved your brother. I loved my brother, Danny insisted, unsure of her words. Truly, asked the old widow, when my motho died, the men who adored him built him a pyre. In the west, men are buried by their doting kin, so I hear. The men of Ib cast the dead into the sea while bellowing songs of love. It is queer that no one, not your Pentashi, not your Andal, not you, came seeking this. From the bag, the crone produced a misshapen lump. It shimmered. Daenerys Targaryen fell to her knees. One of the oldest tales Viserys used to tell her was that of Bittersteel. 
Hagor Rivers was a dragon seed of the fourth Aegon, fierce, angry, and exiled along with the other Blackfire pretenders. Rivers was a villain, a dog of the usurper Daemon, yet Viserys saw aspects of the bastard to admire. With fewer than 10,000, he nearly put Hagon on the throne. That is all one needs. Without his brother's treachery... After Bittersteel died, his skull was inspiration for the other exiles. Keep it, sell it, said the old widow. It is yours if you do my bidding. With the coin, I imagine you could find a smuggler in the western market bound for Kohor. The Dosh Kaleen are not likely to notice you missing. Freedom. Daenerys stared at what remained of her brother. He smiles. Daenerys looked up from the glimmering skull to the crone's lone black eye. She could see her own reflection in it. Her thoughts were of Rago and of Aroa as her mouth filled with the taste of bile. After a long while, she said, I have been rabble on the Sivas board, but I am not your piece to move. I have no reason to loathe Calpono. Without a word, the crone placed the skull back in the sack, and Daenerys returned to her room. It took the better part of the day for Calpono's Kalisar to pass through the horse gate. There was no need, as Vaistoth Rock had no walls, but it was decreed by the Dosh Kaleen. Every man and woman, horse and child, eunuch and slave, needed to be blessed beneath the ice-covered steeds. The shadow of the horse gate was sacred. The bronze stallions should be pushed farther apart, complained a merchant from the eastern market. He looked up at the sky where snow continued to fall. I will be serving customers all night in the cold. The Dosh Kaleen ignored the infidel. Calpono's Kalasar numbered more than 30,000 warriors, more than all the other Kalasars combined. It was not yet as large as Drogo's had been, but was expected to overtake it soon. Kaljako had ordered his Kalasar to stay in their quarter and out of the markets to avoid provoking Pono, but Jaco also feared defection. The Dothraki follow the strong, Daenerys observed and Jocko is filled with fear. Good. When Pono was Drogo's co, Daenerys had been fond of him. He was kind, obedient, and showed her the honor and respect due to a Khaleesi. Whereas Jocko... Daenerys only thought of Aroa. One of his first acts as a cow was to give the Lazarine girl to his blood riders, who raped and butchered her. It was late afternoon when Calpono, his blood riders, and a litter of slaves finally approached the temple of the Dosh Kaleen with their offerings. They were abundant. The first blood rider to present was dressed in bulky, cahoric furs. He gave a polite nod to the crones. We present you the offering of salt. He gestured to the slaves who dropped three heavy chests of Larathi sea salt before the temple. The second blood rider to come forward donned a thick cloak of lazarine wool. He did not bother to speak, but his offering was more than generous. The slaves came forward with a dozen sacks of plates, knives, and candlesticks, all volantine silver. The third blood rider wore a leather jerkin with a Dothraki painted vest over top. He had gloves of leather too, but his arms were naked to the elements. Over his shoulder, he wore a bow made of dragon bone, over five feet in length, double curved in shape. Daenerys knew that bow. It had been a bride gift but she had given it away the night she had given birth. Ago, blood of my blood. Daenerys looked to Pono's saddle. Hanging from it was a collection of braids from his kills. Ricaro's arak was likely left at the horse gate, but she did not doubt he had been cut down along with anyone else who had ventured north from Marine. Jogo? Dario? After the offerings had been brought into the temple, Daenerys approached the one-eyed crone in her alcove. The old woman drank hot fermented mare's milk from a clay cup. Pono dies, Daenerys said. The mother of Matho nodded. During the ceremony, what words do I say? The crone closed her eye as the milk warmed her bones. You will remember. That night, Daenerys dreamed she was wrapped in chains. Drowning. The heart was half again as large as the one presented to Danny. The young Khaleesi brought the steaming mass to her taut lips and clenched deeply into the stringy flesh, digging her teeth around a bite like a serpent swallowing an egg. At the back of the chorus of crones were the youngest of the Dosh Kaleen, swaying and chanting. Daenerys had lost her place with the words and shifted amongst the young crones on her crutch, 
her healing ankle itching as the ceremony dragged on. The crone to Danny's right released her clasped hands and swung her fist like a morning star up and under Danny's ribs. The contact knocked out her wind, but it delivered the message clearly. Obey. You are a woman of the Dosh Kaleen. Kalpono's bride ate ravenously, blood shot from the severed veins of the heart. Snowflakes from a black sky fell in her hair and upon her broad shoulders. The strapping daughter of Zeko was illuminated by the light of torches and the adoration pouring from the eyes of her cal. Pono wore a snarling grin under his fierce mustachio. With strength, Danny threw herself back into the chant, propelling her power towards the bloody Khaleesi in the chalk pit below. The bride took another bite, the heart nearly disappearing. Daenerys gagged, remembering herself in the girl's place, her jaw muscles burning as she forced a swallow of raw meat into a stomach ready to burst. To the Khaleesi below, it was effortless. How had it all gone so quickly? Kalpono's Khaleesi swallowed the last fistful, turned with swagger and smirk, and announced to the Dosh Kaleen in a scream, Kalaka Dothrai Maranha, a proclamation Danny had rehearsed for days before her own moment. A prince rides inside me. The crone's chanting lulled as the oldest with her one eye stepped towards the red woman in response. Kalaka doth ride. The prince is riding. He is riding, the old mummers recited. Rock, rock, rock hodge. A boy, a boy, a strong boy. On cue, there was the ringing of the bells. The horn, the chant from the crones. Eunuchs filled the brazier with grasses, and smoke filled the stage. Then the house fell silent to the sound of wind, the rustle of falling snow, and the lapping of the womb. Daenerys counted backwards from five, then stepped forward with her lines. I have seen his face and heard the thunder of his hooves. A murmur ran through the audience. Calpono's eyes locked on the Mother of Dragons' performance. The thunder of hooves, the company chorused. As swift as the wind rides, and behind him his kalasar covers the earth, men without number, with arax shining in their hands like blades of razor grass. Daenerys's eyes met Kalpono's. Fierce as a storm, this cal will be. Pono's face was still, his gaze piercing. The other Dothraki searched each other's faces, struck dumb by Daenerys's declaration. Daenerys went to her knees, her eyes now rolling back in her head. I see his enemies, nay, his victims. The first daughters of Valyria, cowering inside their black ring, his blood riders will sound a horn, and the wall will crack, opening before his kalasar. Then... Daenerys paused. The spectators waited on her words. Her face filled with dread. Winter comes. Every man butchered. Every wife raped. The entrails of children will line the streets. The kalasar will laugh at the screams of the dying and feast on the hearts of the dead. The roin will grow red from blood. Volantis will burn, its ashes taking to the wind. Nothing will remain. Daenerys shuddered and wailed, pointing at Calpono. He is the stallion who mounts the world. She began to weep, taking her nails and digging them into her face. She pulled down hard, cutting four bloody stripes down each cheek. Her face dripping, she again looked to Calpono. I will be the last Valyrian. I will die alone. She collapsed. The Dothraki erupted in cheers. After the ceremony, Jomo and Moro swore allegiance to Calpono and relinquished their Kalasars. Kaljako and his Kos looked on in silence, while the one-eyed crone gave Daenerys a confused glance. She wonders why I improvised. The celebration swelled with the arrival of skins of clotted mare's milk. As the Dothraki drank heavily, Danny found herself remembering Miro and his second sons, drunk on wine. Jorah's ambush caught the Bravosi and his men unawares, and they were too deep in their cups to pose much fight. The Titan's bastard fled in fear, and Brown Ben became the second son's new leader. What sort of name was that, the Titan's bastard? Daenerys wondered. What Titan? She had never asked the giant red-haired man. I suppose I will never know. 
Sir Barristan slew the unruly sellsword. The statues lining the road began again on the wide road heading to the womb of the world. They were barely more than shadows in the starless night, their faces covered in snow and ice. But Daenerys still felt them watching her. She thought again of Viserys' story of the 79 Sentinels. They tried to flee, but there was no escape. Kohor was a thousand leagues. If her smuggle proved a success, what fate awaited her? The life of a beggar queen? Death by an assassin's blade. She remembered her dream. It was slow going to the lake, but a large steed managed to pull her cart over the snowy drifts. The Dosh Kaleen rode ahead, each paired with eunuch riders. The rowdy party of Calpono, his Khaleesi, and his many allies led the procession. Riding in the rear were Caljaco, Komago, his blood riders and Kaz, all silent. A layer of ice and snow had formed amongst the reeds at the womb of the world. It crunched and broke beneath the bare feet of Zeko's daughter as she made her way into the calm lake. The Khaleesi bathed in the sacred waters, washing the blood from her hair, her face, her naked figure. Ignoring the cold, she returned to shore slowly, seductively, water dripping off her naked figure. Calpono could barely contain his desire, his manhood out of his breeches and swollen. The two leapt at each other and coupled furiously on the shore of the lake, screaming with passion. The drunken onlookers cheered them, drowning out the chants of the Dosh Kaleen. Danny hobbled down the shore of the womb, away from the torches of the Dothraki. She looked back. All eyes were on the couple, save Magos, who spied her disappearing into the gloom of night. To her relief, he did not pursue her. I'm an old dog, going off to die. After some distance, the cheering died away, and Danny heard only the sound of wind, snow, and womb. She stripped, letting her cloak fall between the ice-covered reeds, and walked into the water. Her last time in the womb of the world, the water had felt cold, but on this night, in the chill air, it was surprisingly warm. Warm as a womb. Warm as Dario's embrace. Warm as blood. Daenerys pushed herself out into the water on her back, looking up at the black sky. The water made her feel pure. The occasional snowflake tickled her belly, her legs, her face. Her eyes drooped shut, and she let the warmth embrace her. Eerie had told her the womb had no bottom. If she sank, she would plunge forever into darkness, floating. She let out her breath and turned over. The womb engulfed her, floating, falling. In the darkness, her mind's eye was lit with a honeycomb of memories. Fire and chains and dragons soaring, blood on her thighs. She saw her own face on an armored night and a starry sky during the day. She raced down a hallway of doors, all on the left, each room a riddle. Stories. Dreams. Prophecy. It felt like drivel to her now. Worse than legends of snarks. She had been bombarded with tales not her own, her body a puppet of those around her. Viserys, Jorah, Mirimazdor, Quaith, the Undying, Hisdar, the Green Grace, the Crone. All sought to tell her who she was and who she would be. She had never broken her shackles, had only been paraded around by powers not her own. Who am I? Daenerys cried inside herself. Looking down, she saw a red door drifting at the bottom of the endless womb. Who was I? Who could I have been? The door writhed. It had two eyes, two stars. It was now a mask. It whispered. Daenerys reached towards the starlight. She awoke to the sound of a booming splash. Daenerys surfaced, sucked in air. Waves crashed around her violently. The Dothraki were yelling in panic. A sudden force beneath Danny hoisted her up. Out of the womb of the world, into the shock of the cold air she rose. Beneath her a black mat, writhing, carried her up, slick with water, hot to the touch. Higher and higher it took her into the dark sky. It had scales. Below they could see the gathering at the womb scrambling to horses, some falling over. Drogon, his mother upon his back, roared, 
then sailed down and released an engulfing flame low along the road, catching Coes, blood riders, and Kaz in their flight from the womb. The women and crones fled towards the womb for cover. Their hair, the paint atop their leather vests, burned as they dove for the water. Danny spotted Pono, naked, riding out into the night. He disappeared into the darkness, but Drogon caught his scent, as did Danny. It was the smell of sweat and mare's milk, his Khaleesi's wetness mixed with his seed, the oil in his hair and the horse beneath him. Most of all, it was the stink of fear. With a few flaps of Drogon's wings, they had found him and bathed him in fire. Jacko and Mago were nearly away, but Danny whiffed their mounts and bodies. Daenerys wheeled her mount around in pursuit. Drogon, his mind on Aroa, came down on the men with his crushing legs. Jocko and Mago's backs broke audibly. They screamed as they fell spiraling from their horses, pleading for a Jocka Ron. Drogon plunged into the sky, and Danny looked down on the men begging for her mercy in the snow. Daenerys then returned to the womb of the world. The Dosh Kaleen emerged from the waters, naked, shivering, crawling. Some chanted, some sobbed, some begged for their lives. I am Daenerys Stormborn of the House Targaryen, she told them. The first of her name, the Unburnt, Queen of Marine, Queen of the Andals and the Roinar and the First Men, Khaleesi of the Great Grass Sea, Breaker of Chains, and Mother of Dragons. The one-eyed crone scrambled from the reeds to huddle amongst her fellow widows. She had been right. Danny had remembered her words. To you women, Daenerys continued, I am your high priestess. In the falling snow beneath the Mother of Mountains, the women of the Dosh Kaleen knelt and bowed their heads.